Nabil Nayal, it's so wonderful that we're here together in the British Library. I don't really know how to start this conversation <laughs> <laughs> because it's so big. Um, it's about uh, the importance of research, the importance of, of education within fashion. But first of all, I do, I do want to start by asking you how you describe yourself. A lot of people say, well, you know, you've, you've done a PhD, you're a designer, you kind of do design, but you also do a lot of research. And uh, you know, how do you, would you be able to define yourself? And I don't think there's a way to define what I do in one kind of term. You know, I don't call myself just a fashion designer. I don't think I'm just an academic. I think the closest thing I've gotten to is maybe somebody like a practice-based researcher who is interested in making stuff, loves making stuff, but also absolutely loves researching as well and figuring things out, asking questions, but also, I suppose, likes to impart knowledge and disseminate that to, to people, students, kids, because I think within the work that I do, the research that I undertake, there's so much that I learn. I feel like if I just take that into myself, it feels a bit like it just gets, it gets stuck with me and I want to actually release that back out to the world, if that makes sense. Young people always wonder, how do I become a fashion designer? How do you arrive at the point where you can, you can be in business? I got the BFC Education Fund, which was literally has, is why I'm sat in the seat here now talking to you. Um, so, so yeah, that was 2008 when I went to the Royal College. And now you're a teacher yourself. Yeah. It's one of the hats that you have. You're the, the head of... Course, course leader of at... MA Women's Wear at London College of Fashion, which is a position I absolutely love. It's brilliant. I've been there since last August, so it's a year this month actually. It's been a steep learning curve. Um, I went straight into course leader position, which is, is tough, but I love a challenge. I think designers, fashion designers love to be confronted with a challenge and designers are very good at taking on those challenges and do something good with it. And it was all going really well until COVID and then actually I think things went weirdly even better, probably because of COVID. COVID. So, Could you explain so yeah. that? When it hit, um, as in the lockdown, um, we just stopped for, for Easter and we were halfway through um, a unit and we'd issued this unit handbook and the students were kind of literally midway through this project and it was like do you carry on with that or do you actually react to what's happening around you which is you know absolute you know the industry is ground to a halt the world has ground to a halt and of course it makes no sense to to Karen as if everything's normal because nothing was normal, nothing is normal. And the reality that we were projecting for and guiding the students towards was no longer a reality. So I had a responsibility and I have a responsibility to make sure that whatever I'm teaching is in reaction to one, to the industry, but also projecting, projecting forwards and anticipating what might happen as well. So you've got to the cliche of having your finger on the pulse, yeah, but you've, you've really got to, like there's no excuses. People speak a lot about this word resourcefulness um, mm. and that being an absolute, you know, necessity in, um, in designers who are responding to things very fast to, to society and to thinking about the purpose of fashion. How do you think about resourcefulness? Because, um, you know, the resources are here, literally all around us. How do you set the bar for research? Fashion can't just be about cutting and pasting and mood boards without going into actually what you're, what you're showing there, I believe. So how do you encourage research? It starts right at the beginning. It's the language we use. It's the words that we use when we're educating students. You know, I was taught in a certain kind of way when I was at Manchester. I was taught in a certain kind of way when I was at the Royal College. But this is 10 years ago and you've mm. got to make sure the language you're using now is appropriate, is relevant. and isn't just relying on what happened decades ago because mm. I mean we've, like I said we've had the biggest disruptor to fashion probably ever at least in the last you know 50 60 70 years so you have to review what you're saying you have to review what you're writing down for the students to read because those students that are reading that that are listening to you they're absorbing that information like sponges are going to go out and give out that information to, to other people. So then what you're doing is perpetuating the problem in a way. So you have to make sure in your, that you're responsible for the words that you're using. And so for example, you know, when I look at students' work, if they're presenting me, presenting me with a, a, a page that they call a mood board, I ask them what that means and is the word mood board 
appropriate anymore. Mm. It isn't, it's irrelevant. When they're using themes, you know, what is a theme? That's like a mm. 1982 term, it doesn't make sense anymore. When they're talking about, about lineups, why am I seeing soldiers in a row? Yeah, and I think people often ask me, because I spent a long time kind of looking for, for talented people and I don't, asking me what my sort of criteria are. Well, I don't have criteria except mm. this is person doing something which I've never quite seen before. And I think that only comes about when somebody has put together elements of their world mm. in a configuration that is unique to them. Mm. Um, but also intersects with with what's going on in society. I mean, that sounds grand, but it, it, it can be just somebody who does something very, very specifically well and obsessively, but in a particular way. I mean, how do you, how do you how do you think of the potential of your you know in your students? I think, in a way, with what's happened with COVID, there's less actually less grandeur. There's less mm. smoke and mirrors. There's oh, yeah. less pretending. In fact, it's about authenticity, that's what's going yeah. to drive success. Yeah. Candice Fragus, um, who is an amazing advisor, I'd, I brought her in to speak to the students, said, you know, success will be defined by, you know, two things, authenticity and community. Mm. And that's what I think it's all about now. And I think in a way by stripping away all these kind of pretenses and things well, supposed to be super grand. things have to be made. Exactly. They are made by hands, they're made by yeah. people. They're made by people, um, exactly. And, and everybody has that, has yeah. stories to tell about yeah. that and one, one should be honest about it and that's where if, it, if companies are um, honest about it then exploitation stops. Yeah and I think what we're going to see just in terms of the industry what I think is we're going to see certainly in the next certainly immediately but also in the next five years is the companies that survive the designers that survive are the ones that are agile are bendable flexible mm. can change and adapt not the ones that are kind of fixed in stone as if like you know the the principles that they set themselves 100 years ago are still relevant now because they're not and so i think i say to a lot of students because a lot of students have rightfully said to me you know what happens when i graduate is there going to be a job you know i wanted to go and work for x designer like i'm worried because what if that job just nobody's employing anybody anymore i said i say to them well like if you're aspiring for a job that you you know, thought was there when you applied for this course, then that's the problem because this course started, you're on this journey, COVID has happened, that's the reality. The job market looks different, there are jobs out there, but you have to adapt. You have to not be applying for the job you were going to apply for 18 months ago, or whatever it is, you know, you need to be responding live, real time to this stuff. And so, it's in terms of this generation, what's amazing about them is that actually they have been and are going through the most difficult time in the fashion industry. And so if they can survive this, my God, they're gonna survive anything, aren't they, going forwards? They're gonna be brilliant. British fashion originality um, over the past, um, as long as I've been working, has been based on um, an educational model where you, um, you look into yourself and you're honest about yourself. How much of this, the design process is that being very um, sort of inward looking? And how much is it about facing the outside world? I think it depends on the person. Um, it depends on the designer. I spent, I, my first job was at Belleville Sassoon. Mm. Um, Describe Belleville Sassoon. Belleville's very different to um, a lot of contemporary design houses. I mean, it's, it's the kind of British couturier Mm. Um, of the 70s, 80s, you know, even 90s. They are famous for designing lots of Princess Diana's clothes. Um, they've designed for stars like Madonna. They've, they've you know, they've, they're glamorous. amazing. Yeah, very um, glamorous, very couture. British even the ready-to-wear was like, it's couture, you yeah. know, it's not ready-to-wear. Um, and so that was my first job out of the Royal College. But even then it was like, you know, I lasted like less than a year because David said to me in the bill, you're very talented and I, I love what you do, you're brilliant, but he said you're very single-minded. You know, you want to do what you think is, is right for you and I think he said like you need to go and pursue that, you need to make that happen. Mm. And so for me, I'm very much about looking into myself, asking myself questions, trying to become a better person for it I suppose as well. But I work with students who are very much about asking other people questions and responding to, you know, 
what's happening in the industry generally, what's happening on the planet more generally. But what I've learned about myself, and this really happened during my PhD, was that, yeah, it's all fine to ask yourself questions and challenge yourself to become a better person, either, either as a person or as a designer, but you've also got to apply that to a bigger audience, to the landscape more generally. And you're only, if, you, if you only work in isolation, if you only work in a bubble whereby you're only trying to design based on what you know, what you think, then you're only ever going to be as good as yourself can ever get, if that makes sense. Whereas actually you've got millions of people around you, billions of people actually, who all have amazing pots of knowledge. And if you can tap that knowledge in some way, then it's, the sky is absolutely the limit. Like, even that, beyond that, you know? So I've, since my PhD, become much more collaborative in my approach. It's about working together. It's about this kind of rhizomatic approach to life, whereby it's not a linear, it's not a straight line through of, of anything. It's actually trying to find strange relationships, trying to find strange, collect, can, in inverted commas, strange connections to then arrive at something that feels much more, ro it is much more robust and it can stand the test of COVID, you know, or whatever it might be that the world throws at us. Mm. And that, uh, that happens only through collaboration, it happens only through working with, with people. And it doesn't happen by just working for yourself or asking yourself just simple questions. Nabil, can you describe your experience of using the collections in the British Library to, to inspire your design? Yeah, so when I was um, doing my PhD, I spent a lot of time in this exact space that we're in now, um, which Your is actually... Your PhD was researching um, yeah. Queen Elizabeth I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Elizabeth I. Um, manuscripts, hence this, mm -hmm. this manuscript of Elizabeth I. And it, was, it meant that I spent a lot of time in here looking at it, you know, through that, over that way, there's amazing manuscripts. There's some examples of Elizabeth I's handwriting, which is just like, you know, I think the other thing to say as well, in terms of research, is about immersing yourself as much as possible in that and trying to enter this world that you're trying to create and construct. So for me, it was about getting as close as I possibly could to Elizabeth's hand. This building is extremely important to me because when I was then taking my research on Elizabethan dress to the point of doing a PhD, um, it was about you know trying to find out where all these different Elizabethan pieces, elements, um, uh, artifacts are in the world, and you know there are so many of those examples that we can find here at the British Library. So it meant that I had to come here, and I sat down in this exact room, this ca which is normally a cafe, um, and just felt like I was really close to to Elizabeth. And so I would go in there, look at her writing, come back, respond to that creatively. Um, and then so go back have, up to Manchester. You have to go to primary, your, your mind takes you to primary sources. Yeah, it does, yeah. Um, it also takes me to the virtual realm as well, and that's mm -hmm. something else that is really important to me. So, you know, I described a bit ago the delusion, uh, the rhizomatic kind of thinking, which is a, a, a delusion. Jill Deleuze is a post structuralist philosopher. Um, he, came, he coined this term rhizomatic thinking, which is think of a rhizome, a root system of a plant, which kind of sends out lots of different kind of the roots that are trying to connect with things and make relationships with things. Rhizomatic thinking is a bit like that. It's about um, almost like a constellation of stars and making connections between different stars and finding new relationships. And so, so yeah, a lot of that happens in, in the brain and the mind and it's about the virtual trying to connect seemingly disparate objects together um, and assembling them in, in your mind's eye and then trying to articulate those in, in three dimensions in some way in, in the in the actualized realm as i call it or as Gilles Deleuze called it so one of the outcomes is this beautiful dress yeah can you explain uh, what the what the print is and clearly it's script it is it, and it is elizabethan um it's actually the famous tilbury speech that was written just before um elizabeth put her ships together to you know fight the armada who was coming to invade british shores at tilbury and it's not been used in a fashion context, certainly, ever. So the idea of, you know, because like I said, going into that room over there, looking at the texts and thinking, what's the best way, the purest way, I guess, even though it's like a really problematic term to articulate that in a fashion context. I wanted to just print it uninterrupted, let it speak for itself. And so being able to do that was, for me, a really magical moment because I kind of brought some part of Elizabeth back 500 years later, which is weird. <laughs> <laughs> 
A couple of years ago, was, or was it last year, you, you did the most amazing collection about um, Marie Antoinette and you worked with the School of Historical Dress. Could you tell us about that and how you constructed this very beautiful, magical and very modern looking piece, but underpinned with all of this history? I went to speak to Jenny Tiramani at the School of Historical Dress. It made total sense to work with Jenny at the School of Historical Dress and make it a collaboration. So she very kindly agreed, which is amazing. And we began work and it was just, you know, making prototypes, trying it out, testing it. And then, then the other collection was, was born, I guess. It's the first time I'd done something outside of the 16th century. And I guess after that, it gave me confidence to try other periods out too but not just European dress history, also my own culture too. So after that, it gave me an opportunity to look back at myself and take an introspective approach to my identity. A collection I did um, for spring, summer um, 2020 was called Mixed Other Arab British. You know, I looked to find stuff on Syria. There are really good examples actually here at the library that exist. So there's a mixture of contemporary, but also pieces from history, historical um, reference points journals, magazines and that kind of stuff, which it kind of allowed you to enter, um, you know, magazines from the 60s, I think they weren't, allowed me to enter a time where, you know, things were very different in Syria and put me in a place whereby I could picture a different kind of person living in Aleppo than the person I knew um, and lived with back then when I was, when I was a teenager. I've always felt as a, as a person, as a human being, not necessarily quite British, or quite Syrian, I felt othered in many ways. And I think my approach to archival research and research in general is about not only seeing what's there, but trying to find out what's not there as well. Yes. Can you talk a bit about um, cultural appropriation? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's been a huge issue, hasn't it? Especially in the last few years. It's something that has been going on for a long time. And when you talk about it with some students say, well, Designers used to do this in the past, why is it a problem now as well? Because we don't live in the past, we're supposed to learn from the past. So if you're going to, I say to students, if you're going to look at something from a you know, specific cultural kind of background or context, whatever it might be, either you're from that background, which gives you, um, I suppose, a level of kind of ownership about that, or if you're not, you need to bloody go and do your homework. You need to be in a position whereby if people ask you questions about it, you've got answers lined up. Because if you don't know, answer certain questions, you're at risk of offending people, um, upsetting people. And fashion really isn't supposed to do that. It's supposed to educate and inform. That's why I believe. And also uh, involve people from that culture in making and, and uh, owning it and uh, yeah. ideally being paid for it. Well, yeah, I mean, more than ideally, they need to be paid for it, don't they? So, yeah. And I think that's the other thing, I suppose, as well, is actually asking people from those backgrounds questions. What, they, yeah. what do they think? What, what do they feel? What, do, what mm. in response to what you're proposing, mm -hmm. are they okay with that? Who made us, like, you know, law keepers of what's right and wrong? The answers are out there, but you have to ask the questions. Well, in 2020, it's become very, very apparent that the way that history and fashion history is taught in, in universities is faulty. Um, mm. It's... Um, uh, very much a sort of linear story which is kind of based on, I don't know, from Charles Frederick Worth in Paris to this through the swinging 60s to the 90s to now. Students are now very much critiquing that and finding it very unsatisfactory because yeah. it doesn't look at um, empire, doesn't look at the exploitation of the working class, um, all, all these things. So you're, you've, you've arrived as, a, as an academic at a, at a really, really interesting time where history is, is live and it's mm. being reconstructed. I think fashion is important. People might think it's frivolous, but the, the stories are told that can be communicated are, are very profound mm. through it. Uplifting, yes, and serious and, and really enlightening. Mm. How do you start on a subject, um, researching a subject here? Who will help you? How will you find your, what you're looking for? Confession, um, I still don't know how to use the website. And that's me mm. deliberately choosing not to know how to use that website. Right. Because, Why? Because a lot of my work within my PhD was about chance encounter, mistakes, mm -hmm. happy accidents, under the kind of title of disruption, which is what I'm really passionate about. And so I don't really want to know a system of, of operating, I guess, of researching, whatever, because I rely so much on the mistake. 
um, the glitch, the accident. I've always kind of, I've, I've continued to adopt that mentality of I don't really want to know what's behind this system. I just want to be able to work through it in my own way and let the mistake guide me. So yeah, so when you go onto the library's website, if you want to follow a systematic kind of approach to research, absolutely go ahead and do that. But I think for me it was about, and is about, okay, I'll type this in and see what comes up and actually I end up somewhere I never thought I would go and that's brilliant. And when you come in here, actually, first of all, come to the cafe if you want to and stare at this amazing wall behind you and take that in and then have a walk around, have no expectations mm -hmm. put on yourself about what you're going to get out of it because what you might get out of it is, is something you didn't expect at all and that's what's important, is, is not what necessarily, what you didn't, it's not about what you plan to get out, it's about what you weren't expecting to get out of it in the end. And that's what I say to the students too, so when they've got ideas about a collection, like, well, it's not going to be like that. It'd be totally different by the time you've gone through the process. Well, I totally agree with you about um, about the uh, about serendipity. Um, mm. Last time I, I came in here, there was a fantastic exhibition in the foyer here on the Windrush generation. Mm. In it was a section about an, an amazing designer called Althea McNeish, who came from the Caribbean in mm. um, the, the early 60s. early fifties. Fifties, yeah. And she went to the Royal College of Art mm. and. On the day of her graduation, she got picked up by Liberties um, and she was commissioned immediately oh. uh, for her extraordinary textiles, which was so colourful, kind of abstract, but also full of uh, flowers. Um, and she mm. talks about it being, you know, part of her, her Caribbean uh, her memories of, of, of Trinidad and Tobago, where she came from. And I had never heard of her. And she was an, actually a, a really major yeah. Um, fashion designer yeah. and she had a long long relationship with the Royal College of Art and in fact she only just died in, in April yeah. at the age of 95. So discovering, um, discovering unt untold uh, uh, histories that's, that's a whole avenue and when young people of colour find out about Althea and McNeish um, it's, mm. it's a question of well why didn't we know about it? Once you start to go down one, one route mm. then Yes, I've gone rhizomatic about it. Yeah, <laughs> I want to know yeah. more and more. Um, but I think it's absolutely really fascinating because... Um, it's addictive, isn't it? It's really addictive. Yeah. And I, f I find now that the written word is really important as far as student work is concerned because, because now fashion has to be explained. It's not just cold imagery, st uh, static imagery. I'm finding that during lockdown, so many uh, st students worked at home on mm. their portfolios on, and in what they, what they could make with whatever they had to hand. But also they have started to communicate through video, um, yeah. talking about fashion, um, talking about themselves, talking about all their research. And, and I find that a very, very exciting development in, in fashion because you learn much more about the person and about their world and about what they found out about the world through that kind of communication than a catwalk show yeah. where the models just walk up and down. Um, I mean, do you, do you find this, this development interesting, exciting? Definitely, and it's, it, it, in many ways it's accelerated many hugely important issues, not only the digital, but also around sustainability, yes. around diversity and inclusion and everything mm -hmm. else. And it's, it's been a long time coming, but I think, I was gonna swear, but thank God it's yes. coming, you know, it's happening now because you know, we are people who want to, supposedly as designers, want to be progressive and forward thinking and like be leading, not following. But we've all been following for too long. Like we've got to make sure that every voice is heard and every, every person is accountable for their actions. There's no excuse for ignorance anymore. When you've got a facility yes. like this, you know, with a hundred, is it 150 million? You've got it written down, haven't you? I know it's mind-boggling. I had insane. to keep looking at it. Yeah, yeah, to believe it. 150 million separate items representing every age of written civilization. Yeah, includes books, journals, manuscripts, maps, stamps, yeah. music, patents, photographs, newspapers, and sound recordings. That yeah. sounds so incredible. Yeah. And oral histories, in all written and spoken languages. And then. Over four million digitised collection items can be viewed on the British Web Library web website. Which so when you've is got those, all that, yeah. you mean you've got all that literally here. Like, there's no. And also, you can, excuse. you know, give, given that you know travel is is oh, yeah, obviously yeah. there's a huge <laughs> um, amount of very as well. very you know difficult to do now. Um, 
you don't have to travel to come here. You, you no. can see your four million And more and more is yes. being digitized all the time. So, you know, almost week after week, there's new stuff. And I think, you know, the whole thing with COVID is accelerating that need for things to be accessible. It, you can do it from, you know, your back bedroom in wherever you might be, Edinburgh or Sheffield, or you don't have to be in this building if you can't get to it, or if you just don't want to come here necessarily, you know, it's there at your fingertips if you can just find it in you to go and do that homework. And we all have a duty and an obligation to do that. It's like I said before, it is addictive. You know, when you start, like it, it's like, with the whole thing with liberties, like you said, you know, we have, or I have an idea of what liberties prints are, but actually when you find out mm -hmm. who the people were behind it made it happen, like you realize what you're seeing is so surface level and you need to dig deeper to find out what's behind all of that. And it is addictive. I can't stop doing it. So this is the opening um, of a, an amazing competition, which is, um, is the, the, the next in the series of British Fashion Council, but in British Library competitions. Can you tell me how it's going to be organized this time? It's going to be judged in February 2021, mm -hmm. and it's open to BA and MA students from educational institutions across the UK. It's also important to say that it's digital only for obvious reasons, but it also, I think, is the right road to take because it allows more people to get involved, which is brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be judged by a selection of different designers based around um, a series of webinars hosted by different designers, I guess. Um, and the, I think that's a really kind of cool move, actually, because it means that you're not responding to one designer's brief in a way. You're responding to different designers' kind of approaches to, to fashion and research, of course, as well. So, so yeah, that's what's going to happen. So I believe... The task is that, uh, to create a fashion portfolio which tells an inspirational story inspired mm. by the library's coll collection, so it could be anything, anything literally anything. At all. And with 150 million, <laughs> I, think, you know, I can't remember the thing now, yeah. it, it, there's so much at your disposal. It could just be around sound, it could be around any, I mean, mm. don't pick the obvious stuff, I guess is what I'd say as a top tip, I guess, but you know, immerse yourself in it either virtually and or if you can if you want to come in and it's possible then you know do so um, but don't pick the obvious pick the least obvious thing it is but also be true to yourself choose something that you feel like you can run with because I know a lot of students who did it um, for the competition I did a couple of years ago um, were running their their competition project alongside or with their final projects mm -hmm. and so it informed their final collections I guess and so it's important that they choose or the students choose something that they think is going to be something they can stand by for a long period of time and say, I'm proud of this. But equally, go and make a mistake, go and have a, you know, rely on serendipity a little bit and just have fun with it. Um, because there's nothing better than arriving at something at the end that you just weren't ever expecting at all. It was just this kind of, how did I get here? But it's brilliant. It's that feeling that I absolutely love. I'm addicted to it. Oh, I'm so really excited to see the outcomes of it. Um, oh, there's a prize as well. The winner yeah. will receive a financial prize from the British Fashion Council and membership of the British Library membership scheme. And you get some money as well, which is not bad. <laughs> <laughs> to make your collection, yes. Yeah. So that's going to be really exciting. I can't wait to see the, uh, the outcome of that. And in, in between, between whilst, there are going to be discussions, webinars that people can take part in as well. Exactly, so yeah. It's going to be fascinating. Around themes um, to do with cultural appropriation, perhaps as well, mm. identity, things like that. So it's topics that have been selected, um, very important topics that have been selected to kind of um, just remind people, students, you know, specifically of what is important to be not only thinking about but dealing with going forwards. So it's, it's not only going to be a really exciting, pro exciting project to undertake, but it's also, I think, actually really important to have a go at it because you'll learn a lot as a student. I'm going to learn a lot through watching these webinars, um, through actually taking part and doing something with this amazing, amazing resource. <laughs>